Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Pride Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 6 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. And this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that Conrad and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we are approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. There will be no literary critique. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books we'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book a quick warning today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and it is not recommended for children definitely i will yeah. second and third that <laughs> our show is listener supported if you'd like to support us we'd really appreciate it you can do so by visiting our patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com currently we're posting ad-free episodes on patreon weekly also we'd really like to hear from you and we really mean that so send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com all right chapter six part two we pick up the chapter with gruntle and company the following day as the day passed the bargas range crept down from the north from distant mountains to worn humped back hills Hitan explained many of the hills were sacred sites, their summits displaying the inverted tree trunks that were the Bargas custom of anchoring spirits. While Gruntle had little interest in things religious, he admitted to some curiosity as to why the Bargas would bury trees upside down in hills. Hitan said, Mortal souls are savage things. Many must be held down to keep them from ill wandering. Thus, the oaks are brought down from the north. The shouldermen carve magic into their trunks. The one to be buried is pinned beneath the tree. Spirits are drawn as well, as guardians, and other traps are placed along the edges of the dark circle. Even so, sometimes the souls escape, imprisoned by one of the traps, yet able to travel the land. Those who return to the clans where they once lived are quickly destroyed, so they have learned to stay away here in these lowlands. Sometimes, such a stick snare retains a loyalty to its mortal kin and will send dreams to our shouldermen to tell us of danger. I wonder what kind of shenanigans these spirits got up to before these measures had to be put in place to prevent them from causing issues. Oh, dude, they're spirits, and I'm sure they get bored. So nothing but time on their, I was going to say, nothing but time on their hands, but their spirits. Mm -hmm. um, for the ones that were bad, I'm assuming that they could be responsible for like madness and murder. Could you imagine the things they could do to folks? I mean, just torment them and, you know, kind of be around the house poltergeist style and just torment them to such a way that who knows what they might have done. That, that, that's just kind of on the low end, the small end. Yeah, I guess it really depends on the nature of the spirit and how they went out, what their life experience was like. Yeah. And, you know, especially with what little about the bar gas that we know, you know, other than tribal nomadic, I don't know if they're even nomadic. I just know they're tribal. That's all I can tell you. They're tribal. Yeah, we don't want to jump too far ahead. Well, I can't remember a whole lot personally other than just certain small things here and there, in all honesty. You could assume that any of those tribal people that have to hunt, you're going to have to mm -hmm. relocate at some point. Yeah, that's true. If you're not doing agriculture, just to go with the food, because the herds are going to migrate. Yeah. Man, let me just give a quick shout out here to the fact I love all of these varied tribal nomadic groups he has created here. They're all so distinct. I mean, very, very distinct. There's a lot of them, too. Yeah. I'm always blown away by this. Like, golly, that's, I love it, man. It's, I'm just absolutely fascinated by these. I like the bar guests for some reason in particular. Mm, which this brings me to my next point is i'm curious at the inspiration for this tradition i tried to do some research on this to see mm -hmm. historically have there ever been any human tribes that did something like this <laughs> I know. the most i could find was history of people hanging their christmas trees upside down no, nothing about right i saw a reference to trees buried upside down in relation to bigfoot i don't think that oh, was an word. inspiration so <laughs> you know and that's what's so funny i i too tried a little bit i love that you found the, the like the christmas stuff i don't know if you're aware of this i have uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that uh, that we have t you know taken all these pagan things upon ourselves i think we may have mentioned this once before our american christmas tradition is basically comes from the coca-cola and norman rockwell <laughs> i mean that's pretty much it that's our tradition. It's not really tied to a lot of other things because we're such a melting pot culture. We were, you know, back in the day, they wanted folks to kind of just be on their own. But for these guys, when I looked up like stick snares and things like this, of course, it pulls up drums, guys playing things with their sticks on snare drums. You know, I'm like, come on. Man. Mm. And I was like, I was like, tribal peoples, come on. And so, <laughs> I, I couldn't really get anywhere. When I think of stick snares, I think of the first season 
of True Detective and all those little things that guy kept making. Oh, oh, oh dude. Golly, that just threw me for a loop. That's great. That's, a... <laughs> I, that's the only one I've really watched. I tried to watch the other sec- second season but couldn't get into it as much because, man, McConaughey and – and Harrelson are just magnetic in that one, dude. That is one of the greatest seasons of television that's ever been produced. Agreed. I think I've watched it three times, and it's just as good every time. I want to watch it again. I'm trying to get the missus to watch it with me, but I can't get her interested. And she loves both these guys immensely. And for some reason, I can't sell it to her. That's because I'm enthusiastic about it, probably, I mm. guess. I should be like, yeah, we could, well, we could watch this. Yeah, man, maybe. yeah man, never mind. <laughs> Part of it also is it harkens back to one of my favorite genres of movies is the old serial killer genre yes. that you had like the bone collector seven, yes. Yes. You know, all these movies that came out in the nineties. And I think early two thousands, you don't really see a ton of that anymore. No. Also what's funny about that show in particular, it borders on something that is not usually inside of it, of the real world. I didn't realize people considered this, that genre. I've heard cosmic horror thrown at that like the lovecraftian genre style of cosmic horror for that show i'm having trouble seeing that the idea because of the fact man this is going to be a massive massive spoilers for folks that have not seen if you've not seen this i don't watch and keep current folks but if i've seen this and you haven't seen this a shame on you this is like 10 years ago didn't it yeah yeah so if i say something that spoils it here I, i'm sorry you've had your time but uh, the stuff that ritualized stuff in there leaned that direction Oh. from the people okay you know so that's what they were leaning at it's like okay okay i get you and apparently there's now ties with that in the fourth season which you know i'm intrigued but can't be intrigued enough because i'm i hear terrible things and i it, i hear awful and great things about the fourth season the third season was actually pretty good the second season was weak okay that fourth one with like fonda uh bridget fonda, the Aladdin, i love the setting i'm, I'm always intrigued by about i think it's 30 Not days bridget of fonda, it's um jody foster oh jody foster yeah. yeah i didn't pick up the lovecraftian aspect of it because i think immediately when i thought of any type of rituals like that i think of that place in california that alex jones is always talking about bohemian grove or whatever i don't know which i haven't heard this i don't want to get too far down this road okay (laughs) there's enough information out there on the internet there's a theory out there i don't know how valid it is about rich people powerful people going out there and doing rituals i don't know if there's any validity to it me right on like gay hey, you go rich people i'm just like okay right on, like, wow okay far out like in a really weird sense like yeah I'm, moving along I'm, uh, yeah, yeah moving along please please uh, please gruntle said a stick snare you called it what does that mean hitan shrugged and replied you may well see for yourself gruntle asked was it one of these stick snares that sent the dreams of demons hitan said yes and other spirits besides that so many sought to reach us gruntle thought added veracity to the threat. I, I understand. He looked ahead and wondered what was out there. Stani rode 50 paces ahead. At the moment, Gruntle could not see her as the trail leaned round a boulder studded hill and vanished from sight 30 paces on. She had a frustrating knack for ignoring his orders. He'd wanted her to remain in sight at all times. The two Bargas brothers ranged to the sides, flanking the carriage from a distance that varied with the demands of the ground they covered. They heard a shout from Kafal at the same moment Stani reappeared. The slow canter at which she approached eased Gruntle's nerves somewhat, though it was clear that both she and Kafal had spotted something ahead. He glanced over to see Kafal now crouched low, his attention fixed on something further up the trail, but he had not drawn his weapons. Stani reined in, her expression closed. She said, Boshelaine's carriage ahead. It's been damaged. There's been a fight of some kind. Messy. Gruntle asked, see anyone still standing? Stani said, no, just the oxen, looking placid enough. No bodies, either. Hitan faced her brother on the hill and caught his eye. She made a half dozen hand gestures, and, drawing forth a lance, Kafal padded forward, dropping down from view. Gruntle sighed then said, all right, weapons out. Let's go for a look. From the driver's bench, Harlow asked, want me to keep back? Gruntle said, no. Rounding the hill, they saw that the trail opened out again, the land flattening on both sides. Forty paces on was Boshlane and Corbal Broach's massive carriage. On its side, the rear spoke torn entirely off and lying shattered nearby. The four oxen stood a few paces away, 
grazing on the prairie grasses. Swaths of burned ground stretched out from the carriage, the air reeking of sorcery. A low mound just beyond had been blasted open, the inverted tree it had contained torn up and shattered as if it had been struck by lightning. Smoke still drifted from the gaping pit where the burial chamber had once been. Kafal was even now cautiously approaching it, his left hand scribing warding gestures in the air, the lance poised for a cast in his right. Natak jogged up, a two-handed axe in his grip. He halted at Hitan's side and growled, something is loose. Hitan nodded and said, and still close, flank your brother. He patted off. Gruntle strode up to her and said, that barrow, you're saying a spirit or ghosts broken free. Hitan said, aye. Drawing a hook-bladed sword, Hitan walked slowly toward the carriage. Gruntle followed. Stani trotted her horse back to take a defensive position beside Karuli's carriage. A savage hole had been torn into the side of Boshelaine and Corbal Broach's carriage, revealing on its jagged edges what looked to be sword cuts, though larger than any blade Gruntle had ever seen. He clambered up to peer inside the compartment, half dreading what he might discover. It was empty. No bodies. The leather-padded walls had been shredded, the ornate furnishings scattered. Two huge trunks, once bolted to the floorboards, had been ripped loose. Their lids were open, contents spilled out. Gruntle whispered, Hood take us his mouth suddenly dry. One of the trunks contained flat slabs of slate now shattered, on which arcane symbols had been meticulously etched. But it was the other trunk whose contents had Gruntle close to gagging. A mass of blood slick, organs, livers, lungs, hearts, all joined together to form a shape all the more horrifying for its familiarity. When alive, as he sensed it must have been until recently, it had been human-shaped, though no more than knee-high when perched on its boneless, pod-like appendages. Eyeless and, as far as Gruntle could see, in the compartment's gloom, devoid of anything resembling a brain, the now-dead creature still leaked thin, watery blood. Wow. Just in time <laughs> for a nice, horrific Halloween story. Right? What right. the heck is he creating with this monstrosity? It sounds like it's right out of the thing. It's more like Reanimator, or more precisely, Reanimator 2. Okay, <laughs> let's is, expand on that a little bit, please. It's loosely based on, on a Lovecraft story. These were 1980s horror movies by Stuart Gordon. Fantastic, bloody affairs, gruesome, really kind of smutty, always lurid. Jeffrey Combs, one of my favorite, favorite actors in the B-actor horror movie at genres is Bruce Campbell and this guy, Jeffrey Combs. And he is a student, and he invents this serum that will bring dead things to life. In Reanimator 2, he takes three fingers and an eyeball, and takes three fingers, twists the nerve endings together, and ties it off with an eyeball on top, oh, and puts the juice on it, and this little thing starts walking around. Nope, nope. <laughs> so it's kind of closer to that <laughs> in a weird way, with science being the agent here with the reagent versus whatever these fellows are playing around with. <laughs> Oh, terrible. It's very similar, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, very much so. It's taking dead body parts and reanimating them. That's what reanimator is. So there you go. Okay. It's precisely what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's necromancy minus the sorcery. It's, it, you know, it's the lab. It's Any sufficiently advanced technology might as well be sorcery to someone who doesn't understand it. That is the uh, premise, yes. Uh, so that would be in here. <laughs> He's got the, it's, it's, but in the movie, it's bright. It's radioactive green. It looks like, a, it looks like antifreeze. But like shiny anti glowing antifreeze. It's fantastic. It probably was dude. antifreeze. Dude, it's fantastic. You need to see them. They're fantastic. They're hilarious. <laughs> they're campy. They're dirty. They're I, I'm not I'm not endorsing them because they're dirty. I'm a Christian man. I should, I don't watch it anymore. But dude, it's they're cult classics. They're so campy. They're cult. They're that kind of genre nowadays. In, in this day and age, it's that old. It's past transgressive to campy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Some of the stuff that's coming out now, they just push. Oh, good golly. Far. Oh, good golly. Yeah, I don't watch anything now anymore. As much as I used to like horror, it's just gotten too rough. Recently, I saw something about Terrifier 3 had just come out. Yeah. And they were talking about how many people walked out of the theater. So I, I hadn't heard of it before. The main villain in that looks pretty creepy. So I, yeah. I did some cursory research on this series. And yeah. it looks like there's just a lot of glorification of the gore just to have shock value it should just be called thirst for blood like the south park video game just thirst for blood <laughs> call it what it is <laughs> thirst for blood yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's, it's that's, that's what it is it's it's nothing more than a it's more i i could and i used to be a gore hound 
I always like stories with my gore, and I like weird stories. I'm into weird. If it was gory and weird, fantastic. If it was gory just for gory, yeah, I'm out of here. You know, I need some story, but it, like I said, I've gotten a little more sensitive lately, and it's like, you know, I just kind of stick with the weird. I've always, I've always liked weird. Twilight Zone's weird, you know? I like weird. <laughs> yeah. Gruntle thought, necromancy but not the demonic kind. These are the arts of those who delve into mortality, into resurrection and undeath. Those organs, they came from living people. Oh. People murdered by a madman. Damn you, Buke. Why did you have to get involved with those bastards? Standing below, Hitan asked, are they within? Gruntle leaned back and shook his head. He said, just wreckage. Harlow called out from the driver's bench. Look up trail, Gruntle. Party coming. Four figures approached. Two leather cloaked and in black, one short and bandy legged, the last one tall, thin. Gruntle thought, no losses then. Still, something nasty hit them. Hard. He muttered, that's them. Hitan squinted up at him and asked, you know these men? Gruntle said, aye, only one well though, the guard, that gray haired tall one. Hitan growled, I don't like them. Her sword twitched as she adjusted her grip. Gruntle said, keep your distance. Tell your brothers. You don't want to back brush their hides. Those cloaked too. Bosch Lane with the pointed beard and Corball Brooch, the the other one. <laughs> he, he couldn't even bring himself to describe Corball yeah. Brooch. How hideous is this guy? Yeah, for Gruntle to be put off says something. Because Gruntle is a pretty rough customer, I'm assuming. You know what's interesting about Gruntle? He is experienced as a caravan guard, and he did mention earlier in the book he had that rough night when they were going through that passage and the wagon got mm -hmm. stuck and they killed like a whole tenement block. Yeah. It's not like he hasn't seen violence. Right. But later in this chapter, he talks about the moment before battle. I don't want to jump too far ahead. Mm -hmm. It did change my perspective on him a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about it then. Okay. It doesn't seem like he processes violence the same way that some of the soldiers do. Yeah, he's, I don't want to say a, a natural. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but yeah, you know, there are folks that are. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are folks that are just natural, just natural fighters. As far as soldiering and fighting and killing, some folks are just good at killing folks. I'm sorry, <laughs> there are some folks in war that just get good at it, and you know, are talented. And he seems more uh, not put off so much by that, just more talented. You know, I don't know enough about Grundle, but I like him. He's real cool. He's not as loose as like a bridge burner because he's commanding this group, so he's a little more tight. Less shenanigans from Gruntle. Yeah. We haven't seen any shenanigans. Yeah, exactly. Making him less like a bridge runner. <laughs> Kefal and Natak rejoined their sister. Kefal was scowling. He said, it was taken yesterday. The wards were unraveled, slow, before the hill was broken open. Gruntle, still perched on top of the carriage, narrowed his gaze on the approaching men. Buke and Emancipor Reese both looked <laughs> exhausted, deeply shaken whilst the sorcerers might well have simply been out on a stroll for all the discomfort in their composure. Yet they were armed. All metal crossbows, stained black, were cradled on their van-braced forearms, corals set and locked. Squat black quivers at their hips showed but a few corals remaining in each. Climbing down from the carriage, Gruntle strode to meet them. Boschlane gave Gruntle a faint smile and said, Well met, Captain. Fortunate for you that we made better time since the river. Since Saltoan, our peregrination has been anything but peaceful. I've never heard that word before. <laughs> you have not. I've, I had not until him. I have now come to use this term thanks to the masterful Mr. Erickson. There was one fellow that always walks off way too much in our store. And I said something about this. So one of my friends who's pretty well read at work said something. said he's on, on his usual peregrinations. And oh my word, she just about fell over backwards. And it's just become kind of a term between her and I about this one guy. So. It's come back into use between she and I. That's funny. I don't think I've ever seen this used in another text that I've read. Yeah. Grundle said, so I've gathered, sir. His eyes strayed to Buke. His friend looked 10 years older than when he'd last seen him, and he would not meet Gruntle's eyes. Bosch Lane said, I see your entourage has grown since we last met. Bargast, yes. Extraordinary, isn't it, that such people can be found on other continents as well, calling themselves by the same name and practicing, it seems, virtually identical customs. What vast history lies buried and now lost in their ignorance, I wonder. And I wonder which continents he's referring to. I'd like some more insight into where all Boschelaine and Corbal Brooch have traveled. Yeah, these guys sound like they've probably been almost everywhere or they're on the way to try and go everywhere aren't they it sounds like they're constantly on the move from what i understand yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Gruntle said, generally, that particular usage of the word buried is figurative, yet you have taken it literally. Bosch Lane shrugged and said, plagued by curiosity, alas, we could not pass by the opportunity. We never can, in fact. As it turned out, the spirit we gathered into our embrace, though once a shaman of some power, could tell us nothing other than what we had already surmised. The Bargast are an ancient people indeed, and were once far more numerous, accomplished seafarers as well. His eyes fixed on Hitan, a thin brow slowly lifted and he went on. Not a question of a fall from some civilized height into savagery, however, simply an eternal stagnation. The belief system, with all its ancestor worship, is anathema to progress, or so I have concluded given the evidence. Hitan offered him a silent snarl. <laughs> Kafal spoke, his voice ragged with fury. What have you done with our soul kin? Boshlane said, very little, warrior. He had already eluded the inner bindings, yet had fallen prey to one of your shamanistic traps, a tied bundle of sticks, twine, and cloth. Was it compassion that offered them the semblance of bodies with those traps? Misguided, if so. Corbal Broach said, flesh would far better suit them. Boshlane smiled and said, my companion is skilled in such assemblages, a discipline of lesser interest to me. Gruntle asked, what happened here? Hitan snapped, that is plain. They broke into a dark circle. Then a demon attacked them. A demon such as the one my brothers and I hunt. And these men fled and somehow eluded it. Boshlane said, not quite, my dear. Firstly, the creature that attacked us was not a demon. You can take my word on such matters, for demons are entities I happen to know very well indeed. We were most viciously set upon, however, as you surmise, whilst we were preoccupied with this barrow. Had not Buke alerted us, we might well have sustained even further damage to our accoutrement, not to mention our less capable companions. Gruntle said, So if not a demon, then what was it? Boshelaine said, Ah, a question not easily answered, Captain. Undead, most certainly. Commanded by a distant master, and formidable in the extreme. Corbal and I were, perforce, required to unleash the full host of our servants to fend the apparition off, nor did the subsequent pursuit yield us any profit. Indeed, the loss of a good many of those servants was incurred, upon the appearance of two more of the undead hunters. And while the trio have been driven off, the relief is but temporary. They will attack again, and if they have gathered in greater numbers, we might well, all of us, be sorely tested. Gruntle said, if I may, I would like to speak in private with my master, and with Hitan here. Boshlane tilted his head and said, by all means, come, Corbal and companions, let us survey the full damage to our hapless carriage. Taking Hatan's arm, Gruntle led her to where Harlow and Stani waited beside Karuli's carriage. Kafal and Natak followed. Hatan hissed, They have enslaved our soulkin. I will kill them. Kill them all! Gruntle snapped, and die before you close a single step. Those are sorcerers, Hatan. Worse, they're necromancers. Korbal practices the art of the undead. Boshelain's is demonic summoning. The two sides of the skull-faced coin. Hood cursed and foul, and deadly. Do you understand me? Don't even think of trying them. Kiruli's voice emerged from the carriage. Even more poignantly, my friends, very soon, I fear, we will have need of those terrible men and their formidable powers. Gruntle turned with a scowl. The door's window shutter had been opened to a thin slit. Gruntle asked, What are these undead hunters, master? Do you know? There was a long pause before Kiruli responded. I have suspicions. In any case, they are spinning threads of power across this land, like a web, from which they can sense any tremor. We cannot pass undetected. Stani snapped. Then let us turn round, now, before it's too late. Karuli replied, but it already is. These undead servants continue to cross the river from the Southlands, all in service to the Panyan Seer. They range ever closer to Saltoan. Indeed, I believe there are now more of them behind us than between here and Kapustan. Gruntle thought, hood damned convenient, Master Karuli. Karuli continued, we must fashion a temporary alliance with these necromancers until we reach Kapustan. Gruntle said, well, they certainly view it as an obvious course to take. Karuli said, they are practical men for all their other faults. Hitan snarled, the Bargast will not travel with them. Gruntle sighed and said, I don't think we have any choice. And that includes you and your brothers, Hitan. What's the point of finding these undead hunters only to have them tear you to pieces? Hitan said, you think we come unprepared for such battle? We stood long in the bone circle, Captain, whilst every shaman of the gathered clans danced the weft of power. Long in the bone circle. Kafal growled, three days and three nights. Gruntle thought, no wonder she damn near ripped my chest open last night. <laughs> Karuli spoke, it may prove insufficient should your efforts draw the full attention of the Panyan seer. 
Captain, how many days of travel before we reach Kapustan? Gruntle thought, you know as well as I. He said, four, master. Karuli said, surely, Hitan, you and your brothers can achieve a certain stoicism for such a brief length of time? We well understand your outrage. The desecration of your sacred ancestors is an insult not easily accommodated. But do not your own kind bow to a certain pragmatism in this regard as well? The inscribed wards, the stick snares? Consider this an extension of such necessity. Hitan spat and turned away. After a moment, she said, it is as you say, necessary. Very well. Gruntle returned to Boschlane and the others. The two sorcerers were crouched down with the shattered axle between them. The stench of melted iron wafted up. Wagon repair, Warren. <laughs> nice. Who would have thought such a thing existed? Mm -hmm. Boschlane murmured, Our repairs, Captain, will not take long. Gruntle said, Good. You said there's three of these creatures out there. How far away? Boschlane said, Our small shaman friend keeps pace with the hunters. Less than a league, and I assure you, they can, if they so will it, cover the distance in a matter of a few hundred heartbeats. We will have little warning, but enough to muster a defense, I believe. Gruntle asked, Why are you traveling to Kapustan? Boschlane glanced up, an eyebrow lifting. He said, No particular reason. By nature, we wander. Upon arriving on the west coast of this continent, we set our sights eastward. Kapustan is as far as we can travel east, yes? I bet he has to keep moving if he unleashes a serial killer on each town he enters. Yeah, he needs to find the biggest cities he can, but that is a problem, too. It's hard being a serial killer, man. <laughs> it's, just gotta be, it's just gotta be difficult. Yeah, I was thinking about your comment earlier about how many continents they've been on. It just feels like if this is how Corball Broach is going to behave, they cannot stay stationary. No. I think a lot of this, though, is I'm not sure if it's always just because they're on the run. I think they don't stay long enough to get noticed, except I think they got noticed by Buke and the town, and apparently Darugistan, the council's a little bit, they, they're a little bit sharper lot than probably some of the people they cross. But men like this, in my thinking, seem to have a, it's an insatiable and an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. And I'm assuming they're always just on the move, just in pursuit of knowledge. Different races, different things, different deaths, different what, you know, whatever we can find, especially different species. If, they're, if they like to make weird critters out of remains and freshly kill, it's like, well, then why not get some freshly different things, you know? Well, let's try something different. I mean, nasty, but I mean... Sites of antiquity as well. Yeah, in particular sites of antiquity. Yeah, that's a good point. Gruntle said, close enough, I suppose. The land juts further east to the south, beyond Ellengarth, but the kingdoms and city-states down there are little more than pirate and bandit holdings. Besides, you'd have to pass through the Panion Domin to get there, Boschlane said, and I gather that would be trying. Gruntle said, you'd never make it. Boschlane smiled, bent once more to concentrate on the axle. I bet he's thinking, you don't know me. You don't know me at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's a cockiness to him. Yeah. Looking up, Gruntle finally caught Buke's eye. A slight head movement drew the man reluctantly off to one side. In a low voice, Gruntle said, You're in trouble, friend. Buke scowled, said nothing, but the truth was evident in his eyes. Gruntle said, When we reach Kapustan, take the closing coin and don't look back. I know, Buke, you were right in your suspicions. I saw what was within the carriage. I saw. They'll do worse than kill you if you try anything. Do you understand? Worse. Buke grinned wryly and squinted out to the east. He said, You think we'll make it that far, do you, Gruntle? <laughs> well, surprise. We won't live to see the next dawn. He fixed wild eyes on the captain and continued, You wouldn't believe what my masters unleashed. Such a nightmare menagerie of servants, guardians, spirit slayers, and their own powers. Hood take us. Yet all of it barely managed to drive one of those beasts <clears throat> off. And when the other two arrived, we were the ones retreating. That menagerie is nothing but smoldering pieces scattered for leagues across the plain. Gruntle, I saw demons cut to shreds. I, these two look unshaken, but believe me, that's of no account. None at all. He lowered his voice still further. They are insane, friend. Thoroughly. Ice-blooded, lizard-eyed, insane. And poor Mancy's been with them for three years now, and counting. The stories he's told me. Buke shuddered. Yeah. For Buke to look this shaken, given his profession and veterancy, says a lot about the horrors he's just witnessed. Yeah. As well as the scale of the conflict that is coming in the near future. All that power to turn one of them away, now they're expecting more than three. Yeah, that's horrifying. This is scary. Yeah, this is not going to be looking good. I'm really surprised that Reese is actually telling Buke anything at all. 
maybe it's just the first person that he's been able to confide in that's been traveling with them in some time and he just needed to get some off his chest. That's exactly what I'm thinking. It's this poor guy. It's like, I can imagine Reese going, yeah, it kind of reminds me about the second or third time I went crazy with these guys. Um, yeah, you'll get used to it. <laughs> you'll get, you'll get, <laughs> let me tell you this story. It's just, maybe this will help. It's like, I don't think his story is help, <laughs> but he thinks he's got to help. But yeah, he's got to have someone to talk to. He's got to be tickled pink to have someone to talk to. Yeah, we don't get enough of him no. in this. I don't know if you heard me chuckle. Just when you mention Emancipor Reese, I always chuckle. I'm just like, I just can't hardly help it. I'm like, mm-hmm. I always think that poor guy. He's just the definition. It's just, it's like a bad luck kind of guy. You're like, dude. But he's, he's, he's down, he's down and out. He's got every reason to be down and out. <laughs> Gruntle asked, Mancy? Oh, Emancipor Reese. Where's the cat, by the way? Buke barked a laugh and said, ran off just like all our horses. And we had an even dozen of them after those stupid bandits attacked us. Ran off once I'd done prying its claws from Mancy's back, which was where it jumped when all the Warrens broke loose. Imagine that. Oh. <laughs> all that noise, the cat just jumps on your shoulder and digs in. And I am familiar. You are, as a cat owner, are familiar <laughs> with the flesh rending power of a house cat. It's like, oh, good gracious. Yeah. Most of my really bad wounds have come from a miss judged jump <laughs> attempt that then leads to a a wounding hanging scenario yes. uh, almost like they're rock climbing and they don't have any grip with their back feet <laughs> you know i don't know if you remember these images in history books probably mostly in texas history books but it was some of the rights of the uh, the native americans would go through for the rights of manhood one of them was like hanging from these piercings from their chest you know oh god mm. or the cow skulls hanging from their ankles for the weight and they had to hang for so long to be their manhood kind of thing. It's like, dude, just just hang, just hold these guys up, get a cat real excited, and hang one off you for a couple of minutes. You, you know, you're your man. It's <laughs> you're man enough. You don't need to hang mm. from your body weight. You know, it's just the cat hanging from you is enough. That <laughs> 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 you're, t- that you're t- I'm, Oh, good golly, that's a that's a unique thing only cat owners can really uh, appreciate i guess is the best way of saying that when you see these people they have these pumas and panthers as pets no matter how much they love you Mm -hmm. or seem to love Mm -hmm. you sometimes they are in a bad mood yeah exactly or sometimes they accidentally do things yes and the damage is bad enough when it's just a house cat yes you get these big boys in there and (laughs) i can't imagine what kind of damage they can do to you i mean they kill you well just think about it some of these mountain lions that kill people sometimes are only i say only <laughs> it's a horrifying thought a seven pound feline is is my dad has this one eye we, we trim the claws on and that gal always wounds me always it's like no matter what you mm. do it's like you always get wounded it's a two-man job and it's a wounding <laughs> You will pay. <laughs> you will pay <laughs> it, with her. And, now, imagine an eighty-pound one. That's you know. It's like they, they're all muscle, and they go for that. Ba- yeah. They go for that back spot on people. They go for the head, the back of the neck to grab you. That's where they you know. It's the off switch. Mm. You know, they go for the off switch, man. Like someone says, mm. they go for the unsubscribe real quick. Don't they? <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. The different cats have different killing methods because some go for the throat yeah. and some go for the back of the neck and some even go for more like crushing. I think Jaguars, yeah. they go for like crushing the skull. Yeah. You've seen the Jags. Have you watched the Jags eat the Caymans down there? In- the Caymans? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hardcore. <laughs> It's absolutely amazing. Dude. I think one of the coolest pictures was this photographer caught a jaguar biting something underwater, oh. and it was mid bite as it was, so it was an action shot, and it was a savage looking animal. Right. I mean, normally they're they're pretty majestic, yeah, yeah. but in this case, the fangs the were visible and his eyes were big, and it was mid chomp. It's the killer unleashed. The definition of a killer. Yeah. Oh mm-hmm. my god! I'll yes. look it up, dude. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Repairs completed and carriage righted, the journey resumed. A league or two of daylight remained. Stani once again rode to point, Kafal and Natak taking their places ranging on the flanks. Emancipor guided the carriage, the two sorcerers having retired within. Buke and Gruntel walked a few paces ahead of Karuli's carriage, saying little for a long while, until Gruntel sighed heavily and glanced at his friend. He said, for what it's worth, there's people who don't want to see you dead, Buke. They see you wasting away inside, and they care enough so that it pains them. Buke said, guilt's a good weapon, Gruntle, or at least it has been for a long time. 
doesn't cut it anymore, though. If you choose to care, then you better swallow the pain. I don't give a damn myself. Gruntle said, Stani, Butte cut in, is worth more than messing herself up with me. I'm not interested in being saved anyway. Tell her that. Gruntle said, you tell her, Buke. And when she puts her fist in your face, just remember that I warned you here and now. You tell her, I won't deliver your messages of self-pity. Buke said, back off, Gruntle. I'd hurt you bad before you finished using those cutlasses on me. Gruntle said, oh, that's sweet. Get one of your few remaining friends to kill you. Seems I was wrong. It's not just self-pity, is it? You're not obsessed with the tragic deaths of your family. You're obsessed with yourself, Buke. Your guilt's an endless rising tide, and that ego of yours is a levy, and all you do is keep slapping fresh bricks on it. The wall gets higher and higher, and you're looking down on the world from a lofty height, with a hood-damned sneer. And it sounds like Buke's in a negative thought doom spiral. Yeah. Again, with the negative ways, Moriarty, this is a really bad thing for him because I'm assuming I'm assuming his outlook on life got a little more darker after yeah. this encounter with the Kachin Chamala because he talked about the horrors of the night before. I think that's got a little bit on him, too, at this moment. The things he's seen last night, <laughs> the weird horrors, like the necromantic horrors that those fellas, because he talked about the horrors that these guys unleashed against those things, and they were barely able to fight off one. Mm-hmm. This lashing out at people that care about him sounds like he's in a lot of pain and he's just in that angry yeah. phase and he's trying to hurt people because he's hurting so bad. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Conrad. I wonder if any of Mr. Erickson's background in relation to counseling has any influence on what he's writing here. I wouldn't be surprised if it does have a lot of impact on a lot of his writing. Especially with these really traumatized characters. Yeah. Yeah, because he writes them very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Buke was pale and trembling. He rasped, If that's the way you see it, then why call me friend at all? Gruntle thought, Beru knows. I'm beginning to wonder. He drew a deep breath and managed to calm himself down. He said, We've known each other a long time. We've never crossed blades. Gruntle then thought, And you were in the habit of getting drunk for days on end. A habit you broke, but one I haven't. Took the deaths of everyone you loved to do that, and I'm terrified it might take the same for me. Thank Hood the last married that fat merchant. Buke said, doesn't sound like much, Gruntle. Gruntle thought, we're two of a kind, you bastard. Cut past your own ego and you'd see that fast enough. But he said nothing. After a moment, Buke said, sun's almost down. They'll attack when it's dark. Gruntle asked, how do you defend against them? Buke said, you don't. Can't. Like chopping into wood, from what I've seen. And they're fast. Gods, they're fast. We're all dead, Gruntle. Bosch Lane and Corball Brooch ain't got much left. Did you see them sweat mending the carriage? They're wrung dry, those two. I think that, again, what he just said here could kind of throw a little light on how Buke is feeling so down because of what happened. He just kind of summed it up right there, too. He just thinks it's pointless and they're all going to die. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is it. We're done. <laughs> Gruntle said, Karuli is a mage as well. Well, more likely a priest. Buke said, let's hope his gods cocked an eye on us then. Gruntle thought, and what are the chances of that? At sunset, they made camp. Stani guided the horses and oxen into a makeshift rope-lined crawl to one side of the carriages, a position that would give them a chance to flee inland if it came to that. A kind of resignation descended within the growing gloom as a meal was prepared over a small fire, Harlow electing himself cook. Neither Karuli nor the two sorcerers emerged from their respective carriages to join the small group. Darkness closed in the scatter of stars overhead sharpening. With the supper done, Hitan rose and said, Harlow, come with me now, quickly. Harlow asked, my lady? Gruntle sprayed a mouthful of wine, choking, coughing, with Stani pounding on his back. It was a while before he managed to recover. Through watering eyes, he grinned at Harlow and said, you heard the lady. He watched his friend's eyes slowly grow wide. Impatient, Hitan stepped forward and gripped Harlow by one arm. <laughs> She pulled him to his feet, then dragged him out into the darkness. Staring after them, Stani frowned and asked, What's all that about? Not a single man spoke up. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. She swung a glare on Gruntle. After a moment, she hissed with understanding. What an outrage! Gruntle laughed and said, My dear, after Saltoan, that's a little rich coming from you. Stani said, Don't you dear me, Gruntle. What are the rest of us supposed to do? Sit here and listen to gross grunting and groaning from that hump of grasses over there? Disgusting! Gruntle said, Really, Stani? In the circumstances, it makes perfect sense. Stani said, It's not that, you idiot. That woman chose Harlow. Gods, I'm going to be sick. Harlow, 
look around this fire. There's you, and let's face it, a certain type of uncultured, trashy woman couldn't resist you. <laughs> and Buke, tall and weathered with a tortured soul, surely worth a snake fighter three. But Harlow, that tangle haired ape? Gruntel murmured, he's got big hands. So Hitan observed last uh last night. Stani stared, then leaned forward. She said, she had you last night, didn't she? That loose, grease-smeared savage had you. I can see the truth in your smug face, Gruntel, so don't deny it. Gruntel said, well, you just heard her. How could any warm-blooded man resist? Stani stepped, fine then. Buke, on your feet, damn you. Buke flinched back and said, no, I couldn't. I, uh, no, I'm sorry, Stani. Snarling, she whirled on the two silent bar guests. Kafal smiled and said, choose Natak. He's yet. Stani gestured, fine. Natak rose unsteadily. I'm trying to understand what's driving Stani here in this situation. It seems rather petty, all things considered. I know she's exceptionally petty, isn't she? And I, I didn't remember this pettiness from previous reads. I'm hoping that she'll drop this attitude sometime in the future. But to me, it's kind of obvious. I'm assuming that she's just in love with Harlow. If she's going to be that mad about it. <laughs> so it's one of those, she treats him like crap because she likes him type scenarios. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Huh? I really think so. It's because she's always on about Harlow. She can't stop talking about it. She's mad. And this really makes her more angry than anything else. Is this woman, this hussy <laughs> taking him. <laughs> it's okay for her to do that, but it's like not for some other woman to do that. Billy, that's not fair. It's a, it's a cultural difference, Billy. I agree. I'm not calling her a hussy. You just said it. She was a hussy. I was, I was saying what. What Stani was okay, saying, okay. She's a hussy. She called her all kinds of names that were equivalent to. She called her trash. She did. <laughs> she said something about a certain trashy woman would like you, mm -hmm. Gruntle. <laughs> <laughs> So she's basically just calling it tan all kinds of. Is there a competitive aspect to this? Probably so, because she's very, she's very much like one of the guys in that aspect. Like she, I think that's part of her one-upsmanship with these two, with with uh, with Harlow and uh, Gruntle. I think it seems to be a lot of it is just very competitive. So maybe she doesn't want to get one-upped by the young hussy, as you so eloquently put it. Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> That's her thinking. Rewind the tape. Nice. She called her a certain loose woman. <laughs> she said loose and called her all kinds of other things. And I was saying what she thought. I wasn't calling a tan loose or, or a hussy. I said cultural differences I'll allow. <laughs> Gruntle observed big hands. Stani said, shut up, Gruntle. Gruntle continued, head in the other direction, please. You wouldn't want to stumble over anything unsightly. Stani said, damn right in that. Let's go, Natak. They walked off, Natak trailing like a pup on a leash. Gruntle swung to Buke and said, you fool. Buke just shook his head, staring down at the fire. Emanzapur Reese reached for the tin pot holding the spiced wine. He muttered, two more nights. Typical. <laughs> so, am I understanding it correctly and that that he thinks if they survive two more nights it'll be everybody's turn oh my gosh i didn't even spot it that way until you pointed it out I'm like yeah you're right that's that's exactly what he made to thinking gruntle stared at reese for a moment then grinned and said oh, good golly. we ain't dead yet who knows maybe opon's smiling down on you reese grumbled that'd make a change <laughs> if it wasn't for bad luck i wouldn't have no luck at all sounds like he's that that's right. Idea. That's right. Look who his bosses are. I think that's true. Uh huh. Gruntle asked, How in Hood's name did you get tied up with your two masters anyway? Reese sipped at his wine and muttered, Long story. Too long to tell, really. My wife, you see. Well, the posting offered travel. Gruntle asked, Are you suggesting you chose the lesser of two evils? Reese said, Heavens for Fen, sir. Gruntle said, Ah, you've regrets now then. Reese said, I didn't say that neither. A sudden yowl from the darkness startled everyone. Gruntle asked, which one made that sound, I wonder? Reese said, none. My cat's come back. <laughs> a carriage door opened. Moments later, Bosch Elaine's black clad form appeared. He said, our stick snare returns hastily. I suggest you call in the others and prepare your weapons. Tactically, attempt to hamstring these hunters and stay low when you close. They prefer horizontal cuts. Emancipor, if you would kindly join us. Captain Grunnell, perhaps you might inform your master, though no doubt he is already aware. Suddenly chilled, Gruntle rose and said, We'll be lucky to see anything, damn it. Boschlane said, That will not be an issue. Corball, dear friend, a broad circle of light, if you please. 
the area was suddenly bathed in a soft golden glow, reaching out 30 or more paces on all sides. The cat yowled again and Gruntel caught sight of a tawny flash, darting back out into the darkness. Hitan and Harlow approached from one side, hastily tucking in clothing. Stani and Natak arrived as well. Gruntel managed a strained grin. He said, not enough time, I take it. Stani grimaced and said, you should be more forgiving. It was the lad's first try. Gruntel said, oh, right. Stani pulled on her dueling gloves and said, a damn shame too. He had potential, despite the grease. The three Vargas had gathered now, Kafal jabbing a row of lances into the stony earth whilst Hitan busied herself tying a thick cord to join the three of them. Fetishes of feather and bone hung from knots in the cord, and Gruntel judged that the span between each warrior would be five or six arm lengths. When the other two were done, Natak handed them double-bladed axes. All three set the weapons down at their feet and collected a lance each. Hitan leading, they began a soft, rumbling chant. I wonder what this fighting style would look like with all three of them attached together. I know it. It's very intriguing that the, the join together, you know, I, I kind of, for some reason, have an idea that they set themselves far enough apart from each other. They can swing their big old weapons without whooping each other upside the head or hitting each other, fouling another's swing. So it's kind of like if you get in between them, I'm assuming it's going to be like a law machine or something like that, or like a, some kind of food processor. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. I think the rope, would you think that they use it to pull each other around if necessary, in case one of them's in danger? It kind of keeps their spacing from each other. That's kind of what I'm thinking is it's more of like a measurement thing to keep them apart from, to, you know, it's like if you feel not enough slack in the line, it's like I may need to pull it tight so I don't hit somebody or hit one of them or hit the, like I said, foul their swing. But, but they also get to chant. And I'm curious if they're able to call up some kind of bonus, some kind of buff. They do the obscuring fog, right? Yeah. So they do something, man. They, so and I'm curious, is maybe the thing they're tied together with invested or something as well? Or is it part of it? Or I don't know. Well, it has some fetishes. So I assume it has something to do with it. Yeah, that's probably true. Gruntle heard someone say, Captain. Gruntle pulled his gaze from the bargast and found Master Cruelly at his side. The man's hands were folded on his lap, his silk cape shimmering like water. He said, the protection I can offer is limited. Stay close to me, you and Harlow and Stani. Do not allow yourselves to be drawn forward. Concentrate on defense. Unsheathing his cutlasses, Gruntle nodded. Harlow moved to Gruntle's left, his two-handed sword held steady before him. Stani stood to Gruntle's right, rapier and sticker readied. He feared for her the most. Her weapons were too light for what was coming. He recalled the chop marks on Boshelaine's carriage. This would be brutal strength at play here, not finesse. He said, stay back a step, Stani. Stani said, don't be stupid. Gruntel said, I'm not talking chivalry, Stani. Poking wire-thin holes won't hurt an undead. Stani said, we'll just see, won't we? Gruntel said, stay close to the master. Guard him. That's an order, Stani. She growled, I hear you. Gruntel faced Karuli again and asked, sir, who is your god? If you call upon him or her, what should we expect? Karuli frowned slightly and said, Expect? I'm afraid I have no idea, Captain. My, uh, god's powers are newly awakened from thousands of years of sleep. My god is Elder. Gruntle stared. He thought, Elder? Weren't the Elder gods abandoned because of their ferocity? What might be unleashed here? Queen of Dreams, defend us. He watched as Karuli drew forth a thin-bladed dagger and cut deep into his left palm. Blood dripped into the grass at his feet. The air suddenly smelled like a slaughterhouse. And that's interesting to me. I wonder how many priests of the Elder Gods had to give blood to cast their spells. I'm assuming every ritual attempted to the elders would require some blood, whether some animal or their own. If they don't, ha if you don't have a sacrifice to offer, you probably offered your own. Okay. That's just my guess. That sounds about right. A small man-shaped collection of sticks and twigs and twine scurried into the circle of light, trailing sorcery-like smoke. Gruntle thought the stick-snared shaman. Gruntle felt the earth shuddering to fast-approaching steps, a low, relentless drumming like warhorses. He thought, no, more like giants. Upright. Five pairs, maybe more. They were coming from the east. Ghostly shapes loomed into sight, then faded again. The tremors in the earth slowed, scattered, as the creatures spread out. The bargast chant ended abruptly. Gruntle glanced in their direction. The three warriors faced east, lances ready. Coils of fog rose around their legs, thickening. In moments, Hitan and her brothers would be completely enveloped. Silence. The familiar leather-bound grips of the heavy cutlasses felt slick in Gruntel's hands. He could feel the thud of his heart in his chest. Sweat gathered, dripped from his chin and lips. He strained to see into the darkness beyond the sphere of light. Nothing. He thought, the soldier's moment, now, before the battle begins. 
Who would choose such a life? You stand with others, all facing the same threat, all feeling so very alone, in the cold embrace of fear, that sense that all that you are might end in moments. Gods, I've no envy for a soldier's life. Earlier in the chapter, we were discussing Gruntle's view on killing and mm-hmm. being a soldier versus being a sellsword. And this is the statement that I was thinking of, okay. where we get a little bit more insight into his philosophy around this activity. Now, technically speaking, I don't really see much of a difference between this and that example that he gave where they got their wagon trapped and they had to kill all those people that were coming onto them. Maybe it's specifically in that scenario, you weren't really waiting, knowing you were facing death. There was a large unknown, but it was kind of reactionary. It just kind of happens because you got stuck and then people start coming down on you like vultures. In this case, maybe the issue for him is when you know the battle's happening, whether it's the other army or whatever you're about to face, and you have to sit there and wait for it, not knowing what's going to happen to you. It is a different thing. Normally, Gruntle is a kind of, he, he hires out his bodyguards and whatnot. So they're hired differently. They're not going into face heavy odds against them or even large numbers of things. So I think this does trigger an old war type. Like you said, anyone that's faced a charge, I guess, is a soldier in a certain extent. When you're in like this, it, I don't really know how to, what to make of that myself, Conron, but the soldier's life versus a cell sword's life is so aside from this moment where you don't know what's going to happen in the battle ahead the other difference i was thinking of is the ideology behind the soldier versus the cell sword because that's true when you sign up for the military presumably you have some type of loyalty to the country that you're defending unless you were press ganged into it or something like that right 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 in the case of a mercenary, it's a really short-lived loyalty because it's really just the money. At any point, you could just leave, and then the only thing you lose is your reputation. That's the thing here, but mercenaries are an interesting thing. And look, I'll talk more about this next chapter, I think, as we talk about some mercenaries, as a matter of fact. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> Flat, wide, fang-bristling faces, sickly pale like snake bellies, emerged from the darkness. Eyes empty pits. The head seemed to hover for a moment as if suspended at a height twice that of a man. Huge black pocked iron swords slid into the light. The blades were fused to the creature's wrists. No hands were visible. And Gruntle knew that a single blow from one of those swords could cut through a man's thigh effortlessly. Reptilian, striding on hind legs like giant wingless birds and leaning forward with the counterweight of long, tapering tails, the undead apparitions wore strangely modeled armor across the shoulders, on the chest to either side of the jutting sternum, and high on the hips. Skullcap helmets, low and long, protected head and nape, with sweeping cheek guards meeting over the snout to join and bend sharply to form a bridge guard. At Gruntle's side, Karuli hissed, Kachain Chimau, Kael hunters, these ones, firstborn of every brood, the matron's own children, fading memories even to the elder gods this knowledge now in my heart i feel dismay we finally get a description of the kachain chamal to me very dinosaur like i always Mm -hmm. pictured their heads as something closer to the shape of a komodo dragon body about the size of an allosaurus how about you you know for some reason i feel very much like they're very similar to aliens (laughs) from from the alien film genre to some extent except they had a more dinosaur vibe to them, except now that I think about it, I didn't realize that I forget that they're that tall and they're so big and they're fast. That's also very dismaying thing about these fellas is they say that they're on you in a matter of like five heartbeats, you know, from like a quarter of a mile away. That's fast. Yeah. <laughs> this is a really scary thing. That's why I love these guys. This is such a core memory here for me. This attack in particular. Mm-hmm. Any attack from these guys is very memorable for me. It's just, they stand out, man. The blades and the armor are so cool. I can't help but notice how alien these things are in comparison to all of the other inimical forces that we've come across in the books thus far. Agreed. It's not your typical generic. Uh, So much of fantasy has types of peoples, and we've been introduced just types of peoples here. But everything we've seen so far seems to have some kind of universal fantasy equivalent we can kind of point to. But the Kachin Chamala, they're totally different. Is this kind of like uh, an alien slash Jurassic Park shout out here? And by the way, did you see that clip I sent you from Covenant? Yeah, I did. So that was the ambush attack in Alien Covenant, the movie. (laughs) Yeah. I always think of that that makes me think of that, even though those things are smaller. Mm-hmm. But 
it's really horrific. The high grasses, they're out there. You hear them coming. You hear the drumming of feet on the ground, and they're coming in fast, too. And it's nasty. <laughs> Yeah, the footsteps thumping on the ground, very Jurassic Park-esque, absolutely. Yeah, and I guess, what was it, the Velociraptors were in the, but they were tiny compared to these fellows. Right. But they've got the speed of a Velociraptor, though. Yeah, well, the T-Rex was running 30, 40 miles an hour when it was chasing the Jeep. That's true. I guess it took a while in the movie for it to get up to that speed, whereas these seem to be lightning fast regardless. Yeah, it seems like they're at top speed when they take off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they're the speedsters of the bunch, you know, it's like, boom, we're gone. Gruntle growled, what in Hood's name are they waiting for? Karuli said, uneasy, the swirling cloud that is Bargas sorcery, and unknown to their master. Disbelieving, Gruntle asked, the Panion Seer commands these. The five hunters attacked, heads darting forward, blades rising, they were a blur. Three struck for the Bargast, plunging towards that thick, twisting fog. The other two charged Bosch Lane and Corbal Brooch. Moments before reaching the cloud, three lances flashed out, all striking the lead hunter. Sorcery ripped through the beast's withered, lifeless flesh with a sound like spikes driven into, then through, tree trunks. Dark gray muscle tissue, bronze-hued bone, and swaths of burning hide flew in all directions. The hunter's head wobbled atop a shattered neck. The Kachain Chamal staggered, then collapsed, even as its two kin swept round it and vanished into the sorcerous cloud. Iron on iron rang explosively from within. Apparently, you just take them out like zombies. Yeah. That was an incredibly effective attack from the Bargats. Dude, that was a great attack from them. You can't see what's in the fog, but they can see out of the fog, it seems like. That's cool. And then on top of it, they apparently got a heck of a throwing arm. Because remember, I think uh, they, they talked about them being hard to even pierce their skin, I think, when they mentioned them being attacked in the previous. They said they couldn't even do nothing to them. So this is very impressive. Before Bosch Lane and Corbal Brooch, the other two hunters were engulfed in roiling black waves of sorcery before they had taken two strides. The magic lacerated their bodies, splashed rotting, acidic stains that devoured their hides. The beasts drove through without pause, to be met by the two mages, both wearing ankle-length coats of black chain, both wielding hand and a half swords that trailed streamers of smoke. What a visual all that sorcery would be. Yeah. You don't really see black waves of sorcery very often. That would be awful to see the black wave and that rotting acidic stain. That would be nasty watching it just like eat into those things. <laughs> Harlow suddenly screamed, where behind us? Gruntle spun to see a sixth hunter darting through screaming, bolting horses, charging directly for Karuli. Unlike the other Kachain Chamal, this creature's hide was covered in intricate markings and bore a dorsal ridge of steel spikes running down its spine. Gruntle threw a shoulder against Karuli, sending the man sprawling. Ducking low, he threw up both cutlasses in time to catch a horizontal slash from one of the hunter's massive blades. The Gadrobi steel rang deafeningly, the impact bolting like shocks up Gruntle's arms. Gruntle heard more than felt his left wrist snap, the broken ends of the bones grinding and twisting impossibly before suddenly senseless hands released the cutlasses, wheeling, spinning away. The hunter's second blade should have cut him in half, Instead, it clashed against Harlow's two-handed sword. Both weapons shattered. Harlow lurched away, his chest and face spraying blood from a savage hail of iron shards. A taloned, three-toed foot struck Gruntle on an upward track. Grunting, Gruntle was thrown into the air. Pain exploded in his skull as he collided with the hunter's jaw, snapping the creature's head up with a bone-breaking crunching sound. Stunned, the breath driven from his lungs, Gruntle fell to the ground in a heap. An enormous weight pinned him, talons puncturing armor to pierce flesh. The three toes clenched around his chest, snapping bones, and he felt himself dragged forward. The scales of his armor clicked and clattered, dropping away as he was pulled along through dust and gravel. Twisted buckles and clasps dug into the earth. Blind, limbs flopping, Gruntle felt the talons digging ever deeper. He coughed and his mouth filled with frothy blood. The world darkened. He felt the talons shudder, as if resonating from some massive blow. Another followed, then another. The claws spasmed. Then he was lifted into the air again, sent flying, striking the ground, rolling, crashing up against the shattered spokes of a carriage wheel. He felt himself dying, knew himself dying. He forced his eyes open, desperate for one last look upon the world. Something, anything to drive away this overwhelming sense of confused sadness. He thought, could it not have been sudden, instant? Why this lingering, bemused draining away? Gods, even the pain is gone. Why not awareness itself? Why torture me with the knowing of what I am about to surrender? Someone was shrieking, the sound one of dying, and Gruntle understood it at once. 
He thought, oh yes, scream your defiance, your terror, and your rage. Scream at that web even as it closes about you. Waves of sound out into the mortal world one last time. The shrieks fell away, and now there was silence, save for the stuttering heart in Gruntle's chest. He knew his eyes were open, yet he could see nothing. Either Corball Broach's spell of light had failed, or Gruntle had found his own darkness. Stumbling, that heart. Slowing, fading like a pale horse riding away down a road. Farther, fainter, fainter. Man, he really got messed up. How could any human stand against these things? You really don't. I mean, humans are not equipped to face dinosaurs <laughs> with swords. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, dude, it's, I don't know what you do. Yeah, it's crazy. What a way to end the chapter. Yeah. And thus, the chapter ends. Wow. Dude, not Gruntle. I love Gruntle. He better be all right. But how do you be all right like that, man? I don't see how. I don't see how. Legitimately. The damage that he took. Yeah. The fact that he was able to even parry, kind of, I mean, to block it. I mean, it, it did break his wrist. Just the force of that thing broke him, hit him so hard. I can't imagine. It's a, The mortal race stands no chance against these fellows. No. If there was an army of 10,000 of these things, it's over. No. It's over. I would think so. For standout moments, the bar gas practice of burying trees upside down to pin the troublesome spirits in place. I thought that was really interesting. I love that idea. I I love everything he's created. You know, I think that's where Memories of Ice really starts growing with me so much, especially as I go looking on our reread of this. How much the first two books are amazing, but something about three, the past chapter before this and this, I've just been so full of just all core, just in, and it's just like wild. It's kind of similar to what we've seen before, but at the same time, nothing similar at all. It's like he just keeps one up in himself. It's like, how? <laughs> I'm just blown away by it, man. The master of escalation. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing the aftermath of the attack on Boshelaine and Corball Broach's carriage, specifically that nasty creation <laughs> that was contained in one of the trunks within the carriage. That's nasty. It's really nasty. And the other thing is, like, it's almost like Corball Broach, when he mentioned something about the snick snare, like he was almost wanting to make a body for the snick snare. Like, I'm like, no. No, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. It's like, it's like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Flesh is a better vessel. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed the introduction of the wagon repair Warren. That was good to see. <laughs> what would a war or a fight between the boat repair Warren and the wagon repair Warren entail? Oh, boy. It would be like some type of snap on versus Matco tools type of. <laughs> standoff or something would they, would they both be using nails though would it be like the hellraiser universe where it's a lot of nails and chains everywhere mm, axles masts wheels yes. <laughs> rudders oars that would be dull <laughs> harlow finally getting lucky before <laughs> this unfortunate battle yeah it sounds like his demise and even gruntle's demise from what i can see we don't know how many people survived that battle it did not sound good. It did not sound good at all. And the buildup to that battle was very tense. <sighs> Dude, masterful and funny. It's tense and some humor in there to really punctuate it. Great stuff. Yeah. And then finally, seeing what a Kachan Chamal looks like, seeing their strength and ferocity in battle, amazing. Truly horrific. It is horrific. And that was only a handful. Are there more? Is there an army of them? This is not a pleasant thought. <laughs> As we just discussed a second ago, it's like an army of these we things would know. take out. The, we don't know. I'm assuming we'll find out. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. It's a scary escalation, definitely. It's an escalation. Not enough to warrant an escalation alert. This is not a right absolute level of escalation. But on this continent, in this battlefield with the Panion Domin that's about to come, it's an escalation there in the forces that are involved. Yes. If these are in their forces, this is a order of magnitude higher these if these guys sound even scarier than demons they fought demons didn't even really give them much troubles it didn't sound like it sounded like Bosch and Cornball Broach unleashed some demons as well and it sounded like these guys just waded right through them. right all right Billy great job tonight hey great episode man great job too you got any final thoughts before we drop off here oh I do I got a little bit of this wow dude the Kachanch and Molly revealed dude I've been waiting three books to talk about these guys and we still don't have much to say. So <laughs> wow. You know, it's just wow. And as Memories of Ice does its escalation thing, I love how the series, the series just got up the level. And this is going to be a nasty war, man. Really nasty war. So great job tonight, brother. Great job. Yeah, thank you.
All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.